Welcome to Kingdom Life Church and today's message with Drs. Dennis and Jennifer Clark brought to you by Full Stature Ministries and its dedicated supporters. We are here to equip you with the how-to tools and practical, effective ways for empowering your Christian journey. Join us as we explore teachings that bring healing through forgiveness and ignite transformation in both individuals and families. For more resources, join our mission. Visit us at forgive123.com. Let's embark on this journey together. Okay. Welcome, Kingdom Life Church Full Stature Ministries, and all the partners that are connected with us outside of this local area. Uh, we acknowledge you this morning. And uh, today's message, uh, this follows on the heels of Jason's message. How many remember Jason's message was on the temptation of lack? Mm, there's a temptation there, lack in all areas, right? Well, today's message is on provision, all right? You ready for that? Uh, the who, what, where, when, why, how, and the way of provision. But we're going to use it, the title is uh, really Jehovah Jireh. And uh, I want to start with uh, uh, the story in, uh, in Matthew uh, Sometimes you just got to hear a different translation, you know, to get a point. Well, I like uh, Matthew 6, uh, uh, 30, 33 in the message translations. This, this talks to, this would even be good for Gen Z people. They would get this. It says, if God gives such attention to the appearance of wildflowers, most of which are never even seen. That's an interesting thought in itself, isn't it? God gave such attention to the beauty of creation much of which is never seen by human eyes. Uh, don't you think he'll attend to take pride in you, to do his best for you? What I'm trying to do here is to get you to relax. <laughs> to not just be so preoccupied with getting so that you can respond to God's giving. People who don't know God and the way he works, they fuss over these things. But you know both God and how he works. And we're going to get into that knowing him as the provider, and how does he do that? All right, people who don't know God, they don't know the way he works, they fuss over these things, but both God and how he works, you know. And here is the a key, and we've used this in even some of our module training, because it, to me it's so rich. Uh, it says, steep yourself, and I just loved it because I always thought of a tea bag. You steep a tea bag, you know, and what, what the essence is of the water gets stronger and stronger the more you steep. And uh, you give power to what you give attention to. So it says, steep yourself in these three elements. And um, after all the years of ministry, I think God took, uh, took, the, took one of these to a new level for me. Uh, and I found that it's, 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 it's rich. All right, God reality this is what you steep yourself in, you teabags, you. <laughs> steep yourself in God reality. That's heart to heart, spirit to spirit. That's real relationship. That's not just head stuff. That's drink instead of think. Feed instead of just read. Do you know many of the mystics that had the deepest relationship with God knew the difference between reading ink on a page and knowing that there was a reality to that word, that it was living powerful, and they wanted to meet the author of that ink that's on the page and have it imparted to them to where they become a partaker of the divine nature. Now, God reality. The second one is God initiative. Wow, would that save people a lot of aggravation if instead of trial and error, you waited till the prompting and you were sensitive enough to know when the prompting of the Spirit said to do something. You knew by the prompting. Not a good idea. Not all good ideas are God ideas, but the prompting of the Spirit, an inner yes and no. As a matter of fact, if you're just living an everyday life as a believer and you've got the Spirit in you that bears witness with your spirit that you're a child of God, if you know that you know that, then pay attention to the red light, green light, yellow light that goes on the inside of you. You might be smarter than you think, but it might, that smart might be coming from the Spirit, not your head. You know, if something don't feel right, my, my buddy... Uh, uh, brilliant uh, businessman, he always said, if, 
even when contracts came across his desk, he still went with his gut as well as his head. Like, my head says this looks good on paper, but something doesn't feel right. You know what he'd do? He'd wait, check it out, do some more research, do something, you know. Listen to that gut. That gut knows stuff that your head doesn't know as a believer. It's called discernment. No. Um, in this scripture, it says, steep yourself in God reality, God initiative, and God provision. And don't worry about missing out. You'll find all your everyday human concerns will be met. Give your entire attention to what God is doing right now and don't get worked up about what may or may not happen tomorrow. God will help you deal with whatever hard things come up when the time comes. All right? So this Jehovah Jireh, when I started out my Christian walk, you know, we, we probably all have some railroad scriptures that you wrote in your Bible that were extremely meaningful. Uh, if you get a little messed up in your life, go back to what you wrote in your Bible and you might get back on track real quick. I call them railroad track scriptures. Well, I had one, the one in particular that just never left, and that was Philippians 3.10 in the Amplified Translation. And it was, and still is, for my determined purpose is. For my determined purpose is. People struggle with knowing their purpose. Or my determined purpose is laid out in Scripture. That will keep me on a track of making sure I'm doing it the right way and not coming up with some, some concept or some idea. My determined purpose is that I might know him, that I might progressively become more deeply and intimately acquainted with him, perceiving and recognizing and understanding all of the wonders of his person more strongly and more clearly. Uh, a friend of ours from New Jersey says, uh, you talked about when you were a young Christian, you walked in the various names of God. You walked in that relationship. Tell us how to do it. So I'm going to tell you how to do it. And, and our good friend in New Jersey is going to hopefully listen and learn how to do it. Because it's true. The names of God are attributes and characteristics of God. If you know Jesus, you should learn to know those characteristics or those attributes because you probably need them. As a matter of fact, if you don't have it from him, you have found a substitute for yourself to make you feel that way. Hmm? I always feel sorry for people that, 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 uh, that retire and their identity was too wrapped up in what they did. That's not who you are. It's what you did. There's a difference. You are what you are by the grace of God. I like what God, the way God described himself. What did he say? I am that I am. <laughs> Next time somebody asks you who you are, just say, I am that I am. And I am that I am. And I heard a preacher say that one time. Well, what do you need? God says, I am that I am. Whatever that, whatever I am you need. Okay, it's kind of a play on words there a little bit, but Jennifer will correct me later. She'll say, Say scriptural, honey. I am that I am. And whatever I am I need, God is there for me. All right? So uh, Jehovah Jireh is, Jehovah means the revealing one. So whenever you see a compound name, Jehovah, Nisi, Jehovah, Jireh, Jehovah, the compound name is Jehovah implies I want to reveal some aspect of me. Jireh is provision, and we're going to get into that a little bit. So Jehovah means the revealing one. Jehovah Jireh means God, our provider. And one of the best uh, teaching tools there are is when you want to learn about something in the Bible, uh, it's sometimes it's, it's, uh, it's wise to know where was the first time that was mentioned in the Bible, because they call it the law of first mention. The first time something is mentioned in the Bible, it usually has a great significance. And the name Jehovah Jireh did not appear in the Bible until Genesis 22. And it can said, and it's the story of Abraham. And I think there's a lot we can learn this morning even about Abraham and the way he dealt with things. Um, now it came to pass that God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and Abraham said, here I am. And he said, Take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer there. So Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey. You, know, you should know this story, right? Um, but 
Abraham took the wood, burnt offering. He had laid Isaac, his son, on the altar. He took the fire in his hand and a knife, and the two of them went together. But Isaac spoke to Abraham, his father, and said, My father, here are my son. Then he said, Look, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? And Abraham said to my son, God will provide, Jehovah Jireh. God will provide for himself the lamb that was burnt for the burnt offering. So the two of them went together. They came to the place which God told them. Interesting, Mount Moriah. And Abraham built an altar there and placed the wood in order, bound Isaac his son. Abraham stretched out his hand and took the knife to slay him. And the angel of the Lord called from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here I am. Do not lay your hand on the lad or anything to him. For now I have known you fear God, since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. Abraham lifted his eyes and looked, and there behind him was a ram caught in the thicket. What does Jehovah Jireh? The Lord shall provide. Where's the lamb, Dad? He says, God will provide. That level of confidence. Of course, he walked with him older than I am now. At this time, much older. He lived old. He had a, he had a son at... 99? Wow. Don't, don't do that to me, God. I'm not asking for that. All right. But he said, Then Abraham lifted his eyes and saw the ram, and he offered the ram up as an offering. And Abraham called the name of that place, The Lord Will Provide, Jehovah Jireh. And it is said to this day, In the mount of the Lord it shall be provided. Now that's pretty much the who, Abraham. The interesting thing about Abraham is there's, there's, this is not just one trial nor problem which you may be uh, encountering that God has not already seen. There's, there's a term, Jehovah, Jireh, God will provide, but God has also means God has seen. He's seen ahead. So for me, it was really interesting to see that provision is something that God saw way ahead before you figured anything out. You could still be living your life in a mess, but God figured out a solution. He is so wise, he can even take your mistakes and mess-ups. You can get back on track, and then he can provide. He's, he's not, oh, what am I going to do now? They're not listening, <laughs> you know. So there's no trial, no problem that you could be encountering that God has not already seen. Now, this is the why. Uh, why? Because he is your Jehovah Jireh, just as he was Abraham's Jehovah Jireh. He knows all things. He already knows what you will encounter in life. To me, I saw such a loving father to know what you will encounter in life. It might be a surprise to us when it happens, like, yeah. <laughs> oh no but it was not a surprise to God whatsoever he, he knew what you would encounter in life and he has a provision for you to handle it so God's looking for after God provided for Abraham the ram Abraham said something even greater about God's provision he said in the mount of the Lord it shall be seen. So there are even translations that say Jehovah Jireh not only means God will provide, but the Lord has seen. He has seen in advance for the provision. And interestingly enough, he said it will be seen in the mount of the Lord it shall be seen. Other translations say the provision will be seen. But what Abraham, what was he talking about? On this mountain range of Moriah, the Son of God will be sacrificed as the Lamb of God. And so he saw ahead the provision that God made for each and every one of us to be born again, to be saved by the blood of the Lamb. So he saw ahead. Abraham was way, to me, uh, it was remarkable to me that he was so far ahead of his time because uh, Abraham saw God's provision uh, even with the slaying of his son. I believe he was probably the first one in the Bible to believe in resurrection. He said, after all of these years, you finally give me a son, then you tell me to slay him, then, then 
if, if that's what God's telling me to do, he'll have to raise them from the dead. Isn't that what happened to Jesus, the ultimate Lamb of God? So I believe, actually, Abraham caught on to the resurrection way in advance of it ever happening. He saw ahead to the promise on Mount Moriah that would take place for all generations. I find that remarkable, that that, that, that provision will be seen. And the provision he's talking about, on the mountain range of Moriah, the Lord Jesus shall be provided as a sacrifice for the sin of the world. He saw God's provision for you and me, and he looked ahead to the resurrection of Jesus. So this is why they call that the law of first mention. Can you see the significance of the first time that term Jehovah Jireh was ever used in the Bible was right there. And that was, he was depicting his Jehovah and the supernatural provision that's in there. Now, when I go back to that scripture, here's what the Lord's been doing with me recently. When I go back to that scripture I gave earlier, I said, my determined purpose is that I might know him, that I might become more intimately acquainted with him. Progressively, progressively. Progr means none of us have arrived. Abraham was, how old was Abraham then? 99 years old? 99 years old. And he's still learning. I think you could learn some things, don't you think? Abraham, and Abraham had a walk with God that was impeccable, but look at the level of revelation he got at 99. So we're not done yet. There's more for us to learn, and we need to humble ourselves and learn it. Huh? So it, it's like 99 years old, and he gets a revelation of the provision of God. Don't tell me that for 99 years he did not walk in the provision of God. So that tells me it can go deeper. So I re-looked at that scripture in the message where it says, steep yourself in God reality. That's spirit-to-spirit -spirit relationship. That's prayer to where you're touching God, drinking, not just thinking, feeding, not just reading. Then it says initiative. That means I'm in such good communion with God, I can tell by my spirit when I'm prompted to do it and not to do it. Red light, green light, yellow light. So I've got that God initiative working in me. I can tell when he's leading me one way and telling me, don't do that. But the third one was provision. And I've told you stories we hear how God provided for me when I had $12 in my checkbook and transmission trouble and everything. And I said, well, I wonder how God's going to work this out. That was a quality attitude for a baby Christian. But I still see, well, here's what God's doing after all these years for me. He's showing me that Yes, that was God's provision outside, and the provision that you expect will be outside of you, because it has to do with circumstances and people. However, what he's saying in that scripture, steep yourself, we should be steeping ourselves in the provision, because guess what? Jehovah Jireh is a person. It's not a stuff. It's a person. Jehovah Jireh is Jesus. Jesus is Jehovah Jireh. So steep yourself in God reality, steep yourself in God initiative, but steep yourself in Jehovah Jireh and walk with him in that relationship. So for our friend in New Jersey, today I'm going to tell you how to walk in Jehovah Jireh because I just learned myself recently that provision, the reality is present tense, the initiative is present tense, and the provision is not just something that happens outside of you. The provision is in you. He is that I am. Whatever I am you need, I am that I am, or what I am, provision. You start from the place of provision. Your decision-making will be better. Your actions will be better. You'll see productivity. You'll accomplish more with less effort. Anybody like that idea? Accomplish more with less effort. Yeah. yeah. Now, steep yourself in God provision. So what I saw was Abraham took provision to a deeper level because I believed he walked with him for 99 years. He saw the beautiful provision of God. You read the story of Abraham, you see it. Father Abraham, he set an example for provision. But at this point in time, he moved to a whole other level in understanding provision. And that provision was God himself in me. Not only is he providing for me, outside of me, he is my provision. He is my all in all. Now, interestingly enough, 
uh, this switch is steep yourself in God provision. Well, how do you steep yourself in God provision? Well, God provision is a person. It's not stuff. It's not an answer to prayer. It includes all of those things, but that's not what it is. So I'm going to steep myself in Jehovah Jireh, my provider, the one who sees in advance of everything that I'll ever encounter. So I could be stunned on, on one day, but the next day God gives you a solution. And you may not even understand part of the solution, but the divine initiative says, okay, do this then. Okay, well then do that. Do you know that I built my first church that way? I had no plan except obeying God step by step. And then it came out, and I had pastors came from miles around to copy my infrastructure, and I found that quite amusing. You're going to copy an infrastructure that I didn't even know how to do it. I just did one baby step at a time and let God do bring the, bring the appropriate response. So let this be a lesson. I really believe God's going to take us into a whole other level of, of understanding provision as a person, not an it, not stuff, him. Jehovah Jireh. Now, how, how does this happen? Uh, we did the who, Jehovah Jireh. We did the why, <laughs> because we saw that it reflects the ultimate provision of Jesus Christ, him, him as Jehovah Jireh. Now, I want to bring this up. Um, how does this happen? In two different accounts, I want you to listen to this. We already read the one, you know, the grass, uh, the flowers, how beautiful they are, and you know, the, most of the world doesn't even see some of the beauty that God created. All right? But Matthew 6 says, But when you pray, go into your room, and when you have shut the door, pray to your Father who is in, secret, in the secret place, and the Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. And when you pray, do not use vain repetitions, as the heathen do, for they think that they will be heard because they talked a lot. <laughs> Therefore, do not be like them, for your father already your father already knows. There's Jehovah Jireh. Your father already knows the things you have need for before you ask. Your father in heaven already knows what you need for before you ask. Hmm. In this manner, therefore, pray. Our Father, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. I was a baby Christian, and I felt prompted that God says, I never prayed for a refrigerator or for a stove. I may have needed a refrigerator or a stove, but I never prayed for one. God said, you pray for daily bread. And I don't mean food on your table. I prayed for the bread of life, that he was the manna that came down from heaven. He was the bread. He was my sustenance. Man cannot live by bread alone, the natural bread, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And so I, I don't know. I did quite well never, never praying for stuff. And, and, my father knows the things that I'll need before, before I ask him. In this manner, therefore, pray. And, and he gives it, uh, Madam, uh, who was it? Um, Teresa Bavilla was a mystic woman, very close to God. She actually prayed the Lord's Prayer in reverse. <laughs> As an experience, not words. It wasn't like praying a rosary. It wasn't just vain repetition. It was in reverse. Yours is the kingdom. Yours is the power. Yours is the glory. Lead me not into the temptation. It's like God threw an anchor of love, and then he drew you in. If you look at the Lord's Prayer in reverse, say, here's the way I want to experience. Deliver me from evil. Lead me not into temptation from sidetracks. Huh? Forgive as I forgive others. Feed me with a greater sense of the the. Uh, bread of life, thy will be done. Your kingdom come, your will be done. And I honor you, Dad. Father God, my Abba, your Abba. In reverse, she saw it as a lifestyle. That's what God did. He drew us out of, from. So in the Lord's Prayer, it says in uh, Matthew 6, It came to pass as he was praying in a certain place. This is Luke 11 now. And, and uh, these two accounts are years apart in the Bible. But Matthew 6, Lord, teach us how to pray. 
But in Luke 1, it came to pass as he was praying in a certain place, one of those disciples said to him, Lord, teach us how to pray. And as John also taught his disciples, meaning John the Baptist. So he said to them, when you pray, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth. Give us this day. Forgive us our sins as we forgive others who are indebted to us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. I kind of like that, that little kid's version that uh, Jason sent me a little clip from a pastor who was teaching his child to pray <laughs> the Lord's Prayer. And the child said, deliver me from temptation. <laughs> uh, no, no, lead me not into temptation and deliver me from people. <laughs> hey, whatever works. I mean, you got to start somewhere, right? I mean, how, about, how many times have you ever lost your temper and said, God, deliver me from people? I mean, you, gotta, you have to start with what you got. Now, neither implies, in both cases, if we're really going to understand Jehovah Jireh, neither one implies that you tell them your situation. Man, we, we could minister to people so much more effectively if they didn't give us the long story version of their situation. Why don't we just kind of narrow it down to what do, you, what do you need and how can we get God meet that need? Yeah, you got a it's kind of awkward territory because when you're ministering to somebody, if you don't listen to them, then you're rejecting them. But on the other hand, a lot of what they're saying is venting. Venting is not ministry. So are you willing to? So what do you do with the person who talks a lot, never stops talking, and they're going to tell you their whole life story, and you're trying to you're trying to minister to them and they're hurting and they're bleeding all over the place and, and, they're, they're, and they're actually fortifying. If they're angry, they're making the anger worse by like more and more about, I'm going to kill those kids when I get all of them. Oh, God, blah, blah, blah. All right. You know what I used to do when we traveled and it worked? This is real deep spiritual truth. I used to go, oh, oh, right there. And they would stop talking and we could pray through what really needed to be prayed through. <laughs> ooh, ooh, has a way of getting people's attention for some reason. Like in the multitude of my words, all of a sudden, Dennis went, ooh, ooh. There must have been something in what I said. Yeah, and we can deal with it rather than you fortify it and talk about it forever. Venting is not healing. <laughs> However, confess your faults to one to another that you might be healed. On the other hand, though, you, you need to be able to verbalize it, but you also need to be willing to deal with it. <laughs> so... Okay, so neither one of those situations on Lord, teach us how to pray, neither one implies that you have to tell them your whole situation. And those two accounts are two years apart. But here's something I think we should just ponder, what the, what the scripture says. Uh, My God shall supply all of your need according to his riches in glory. I think where they're at is important to understand. And God is a holy God, and he's not, gonna, he's not going to, well, that's what the scripture says. You do not have because you don't ask. I, I can handle it. I can take care of this. I've got a way. I figured it out. You have not because you don't ask. But then again, you do ask, and you don't receive. That ever happened to you? You ask, and you didn't receive? <clears throat> because you were asking amiss. You wanted to consume it upon your own selfishness. Huh. Your own lust. So you have not because you ask not, but then you ask and you don't receive because you ask the myth. But if you steeped yourself in God's provision, you'd be coming out of what was pure, holy, and of him. And you would know. You would have divine initiative. You would have divine reality. You have a relationship with Jehovah Jireh, the person, the Lord Jesus himself. No. When, uh, <clears throat> when I look at needs... My God shall supply all of your needs. I think sometimes that goes over your heads as far as needs. What needs? <clears throat> in, our, in our last book, we put the seven thrones. Seven internal thrones of authority or seats of authority that either God's ruling it or you're ruling it. And the first one is spirit. And what was the major part of Jehovah Jireh? Jehovah Jireh was he saw forward and made through the blood of Jesus, the redemption of Jesus on the cross. 
You need born again first. That's the provision for your spirit. And there's additional provision for your spirit because the letter kills, but the spirit brings life. So you progressively become more intimately acquainted and make the scriptures become real. Now, we'll get to that. So the seven thrones, though, is their spiritual need that Jehovah Jireh wants to meet. Jesus wants to meet that spiritual need. There's mental needs. There's thoughts. How does he deal with that? Well, he teaches you how to bring thoughts captive to the obedience of Christ. Well, then there's the will. Well, steep yourself in God initiative keeps that will. I always like that expression from uh, uh, Merton. <clears throat> Moses, first thing. Mert, Mert, Thomas. Thomas Merton. Thomas Merton said, if you really understood the will as a Christian, it would be a romance of wills. Not drudgery, not, oh, I got to yield this, I'm supposed to do it God's way. <laughs> no, a romance of wills is to where you, it's like a beautiful dance in the spirit. The greater one has authority over your will. And you learn yielding and surrendering as a way of life. You live by dying and you wage war by surrendering. <laughs> Sounds kind of contradictory. But in reality, that exalts him as the victor. Emotions. What's, what's God's provision for the emotions? This is something that you should be able to say. It's not a half a gallon ice cream. It, it really isn't. I watch Hallmark movies. I've seen them, huh? When you're having a bad day, you eat a half a gallon ice cream and then you emotionally feel better. No, the emotions is the fruit of the spirit. If you're not living in the fruit of the spirit, if you're not enjoying righteousness, peace, and joy, primarily the peace of God should be ruling if you're not enjoying that, what you're living is not Christianity. Your physical body. Your physical body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. God's made provision for that body. And we should be God welcoming it, get the rest and the sleep, do our part. But on the other hand, we should be welcoming. We have a book on that. Releasing the divine healer. We should be welcoming Jehovah Jireh, our provision, who, if he knit me together in my mother's womb, I really trust him more than anybody else's opinion on what's going on in my body. I mean, there are, there's, there's people that are helpful, but I'm just saying, my prim primaries should be, God, I am welcoming you into my physical body. This is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Now, <clears throat> Relationships. That's all relationships, friend and foe, family and non-family. Jehovah Jireh says, I made a provision, and I've made a provision for all relationships, whether you like them or not. I made, I made, a, I made provision for them, and what I'm looking for is your response, not you correcting them, but your response to them. I don't want reaction, I want response. And, you know, I, I still can't get over this. When did this all happen? Jehovah Jireh, when was the first time it was mentioned? This incident, he was at least 120 years old. If God can give me a son when I'm 99, and this incident happened when he was 120, I don't think we're done learning, are we? Huh? Jason's got a jubilee coming up. You might only get a couple of them. <laughs> so make the use, of, make the best use of that. If he can give me a son in 99, he'll make sure that his promise is kept. But Abraham's faith was so strong, he believed that God could raise Isaac from the dead. Abraham did not fall apart. I guess... Uh, when I was a young Christian, what, what helped me understand the difference when you, you know, asking for stuff or seeing stuff happen or seeing stuff not happen uh, was God says, dual awareness, Dennis. I'm going to teach you to be aware of what's going on right now, good or bad, but at the same time, spirit timing is not the same as your timing. 
dual awareness is spirit timing versus soul timing. Soul timing, you got, you, we live in this world, we're aware of the time. There's a lot of uh, prophetic words right now about the Kairos time and the exact time, and then there's Kronos time, the, just time in general. But in the spirit, we need to know, am I yielding to spirit time over soul time? You know, how many people, I've seen backslid actually because something didn't happen on their timetable. That did not mean that God was not going to come through. He just didn't do, he, you just, you were general manager of the universe and didn't like the, uh, having to wait. <laughs> I was general manager of the universe once in a while. I'm not anymore, but I still campaign every now and then. <laughs> but it, it's something you have to get weaned out of. Put God in control. All right. So where did this all happen? And here's something I think you would pay attention to. You want to see God's provision? For heaven's sakes, the scripture says in Acts 17, 26, he has made one blood every nation of men to dwell on the face of the earth, and he has determined their pre-appointed times and boundaries of their dwellings. You need to be where God's got you to be. You can't just bounce all over a place and think that you're doing God's will unless he's initiating it. You might be trying to fill an unmet need rather than letting God meet your need. You need to be in the right place at the right time. You need to know right from wrong. It's got to place that time and place. There is a where that's sufficient. I can still remember uh, a, a waitress came. When I came down here cold, $3,000 in the checking account and no place to live, and pulled up to a car, and the person rolled the window down and said, God's had me sitting in this car waiting for someone to ask me for directions. I go, yeah. And I asked him for the direction for a few churches. And he gave me the direction, and uh, this was on a Friday, and on a Saturday, Friday night, I went to, um, I think it was, uh, uh, I don't know, this is a, I think it was the Olive Garden. I went, and I went to the Olive Garden, and I'm thinking it's like having my last meal. <laughs> Before I know what I'm doing with the rest of my life, I've been obedient to what I knew, but I don't know what provision lies ahead. And I'm not going to try to make it happen. I sat down and had a good spaghetti meal, good Italian meal, and a waitress came over and sat down. Waitresses do not sit down with clientele. And she said, I don't know why I'm doing this. But if you're thinking of moving into this area or something, I don't know. I mean, I don't know where you're from. I'm thinking, oh, she heard my Yankee accent or something. I don't know. And I'm going, she said, but in Rock Hill, a bunch of us rent a place. We go to school. We rent in Rock Hill. And like four of us ladies get together and split the cost. Got up and walked away. Rock Hill was the only part that stuck. Long story later, all the miracles that took place between me meeting Jennifer and it's in the books first place we went to look for was Rock Hill. Mm -hmm. Our first house was in Rock Hill. And we were there, and then we knew my mom and dad were going to live with us and come from Pennsylvania. So we were looking for another house that was bigger. And we looked everywhere. Talk about God's provision and your efforts. Huh? Have you ever done this? Then you're so shocked when God does it, but at the same time, you did everything you could think of. And you go, I don't know. We checked every subdivision in Rock Hill and, and Fort Mill, and nothing felt right because I'm still going with our gut. So I don't know. So we go home, and Jennifer's on the Internet, and she goes, oh, here's a place that, uh, that we haven't tried. Here's a place that's called Bailiwick. She said the word Bailiwick, and the power of God flooded the room. That's provision when you're in, your heart attitude is in the right place. By the way, none of those other places worked. <laughs> Surprise. Bailiwick and the power of God. I said, that's it. That's where we're going to live. Sight unseen. Did not see the house. Did not see the neighborhood. Did not see. Walked up and the builder just happened to be there. Was ready to put a real estate sign, but said, mm, are you interested in this house? Well, well, we'll skip the real estate. You deal with me. And that's right next door in Bailiwick. 
And then a long story short, we did travel for 12 years, and then we knew we were going to go with uh, Jim Golan in Tennessee. Then we were going to go to Florida, and then we were going to go New England, and then we were gonna, and then I pulled out of my driveway and got pointed to this little building. He says, "There's your relocation." I came over here and I thought, "Hmm, this ain't going to be as big as my first church, <laughs> not unless we have we have to have five services." <laughs> or who knows? Don't, oh God, don't. It. <laughs> so I don't want to get in trouble here prophesying something but anyway the spirit timing and soul timing but once everything fell into place and bailiwick means your jurisdiction your neck of the woods in England a bailiff is in charge of a bailiwick so I feel we have a prayerful responsibility here because God has appointed the exact time and the exact place in which you should live. You need to honor that. I don't care if you, if God appointed a job that you don't like, you'd be the best person you can be on that stinky job and you'd be honoring God. And promotion doesn't come from the east or the west. It's God that lifts up one and puts down another. So sometimes he's teaching you a lesson in the process. As soon as I was willing to do everything God wanted me to do, when, when I was a young Christian and, and was cleaning toilets and mopping floors, he got me a desk job within two weeks. After the desk job, I got called back to a machine that made actually very, very, very good money that I used to operate, and the union kept putting it up for bid, and nobody wanted it because it was too hard. I thought it was easy myself, but that's because I could do it. <laughs> and nobody wanted that job. They called me up. And the next thing you know, everything was black. But it, it's like, it's, it's like God's provision comes with obedience and it goes beyond your understanding. It's not about your planning. It's, it's good to plan to a level, but at the same time, once you have a plan, did you submit it to God? Or is that your plan? There's a big difference. God has predetermined your life and he knew, knows in advance what you need and how to provide for it. And if you see a lack of provision, there might be something you're not doing. Now, the where of all this, he's appointed the exact time and the exact place. And here's, here's where Kingdom Life Church fits in uh, actually quite well. And I'm really, really proud of the work that Garrett's doing and, and Vicki and Brad and the, and the small groups. Uh, it, it's outstanding, the life change in people's lives. But what it is, is here's what actually is taking place supernaturally. Divine appointments. People were actually coming together and orchestrated because God put you together. It wasn't your idea. You, well, you might even think it's your idea. <laughs> but I would humble myself and say, God must be doing something that I don't understand. Divine appointments become divine connections if they cooperate. If they cooperate. Not everybody's going to cooperate with a divine connection because they think, oh, if anybody knew what I was really like, they wouldn't talk to me. <laughs> well, Guess what? God's watching you anyway. Are you talking to him? Divine appointments become divine connections. Divine connections become a divine synchronization, right? Greg had that word once, that people coming together synchronize. The eye, the foot, the hand, nobody's more important than someone else, but the synchronization of all of those parts, just like your physical body. You know, appreciate your foot, your arm, your ankle, your head. You know, you need it all. And it all works together, synchronized. That's the divine order. And it begins, and then God gives an assignment with that divine order, and you enter into divine purpose. So Je Jehovah Jireh wants you to enter into supernatural provision and supernatural purpose. You know how many times when we travel church to church, how many times we heard people say, I don't know what my purpose is. There's really no excuse for that. You were predestined. Look up the four predestined in the, in the New Testament, and it tells you. you. You were predestined for a relationship with Jesus. You were predestined unto good works. You were supposed to be predestined to his character development, his love nature. You were predestined to function as Sabbath sons and daughters. Sabbath son means... You were created by God and predestined to function, to walk in the spirit of peace. Supernatural peace. You were 
Sabbath sons and daughters means you've entered into a rest of God and that's your life, regardless of people and circumstances. Sabbath sons and daughters. Those that have entered into a rest, though they walk. Then you accomplish more with less effort. I like that. I always like that. Accomplish more with less effort. Now, that's the divine purpose. How does this happen? Okay, for our lady friend in New Jersey, uh, I talked with you on the phone this week, and it was like, how do you do that, Dennis? You've talked about walking in the various relationships of the names of God. Well, no matter what name of God, what attribute, what character, it God builds according to a pattern based on a principle. He does it the same way. So I'm going to do Jehovah Jireh, but this applies to every compound name, Adonai, uh, Elohim, uh, Jehovah Nisi, Jehovah Jireh, Jehovah Mekadesh, Jehovah Jehovah, oh, there's a lot of Jehovahs, but each one is depicting an aspect of the character and the nature of Jesus, each one. Which one do you need? I am that I am. I am that I am. Whatever it is you need. But for Jehovah Jireh, to make it life to me, I've got to understand, just like Moses, that the, he made known his ways to Moses, his acts to the children of Israel. The children of Israel saw his acts outside of them. And thank God for it. Moses knew his ways. It's more important to know the ways than to just observe, be an observer of the acts of God, even the good acts of God. It's still better to know his ways. So uh, God's saying, receive with meekness that engrafted word. That's what's going to save your soul. Now, I'm going to close with this so that you, if you wanted to take notes on something, ooh, um, this is what you would need. How do, I, how do I make that name a reality? How do I make uh, Jehovah Jireh? Number one, it starts, there is uh, two parts to this, and we teach this in our modules. There is an in-working, and then there is an out-working. But if you would write these down and use them in your prayer time, you'd be surprised, pleasantly surprised, at how quickly you absorb the Word of God. You feed instead of read, you drink instead of think, because it's spirit to spirit, heart to heart, all right? Step number one, I'm going to give you five steps in, five steps out. How's that? That's easier. Step number one, for as me and my house, we will serve the Lord. You're going to have to decide you want to do this. That's how we, we would give homework because we couldn't minister to everybody when we traveled. But if they wouldn't be willing to do an even easy homework, we said, I've got to move on to someone else. Because you've got to at least make step one a choice to get in the presence of God. Every step in all of life's circumstances, uh, I'm going to spend some time with this in working. Just, as me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. At least start there. That's a choice. The second part is a little bit harder because your flesh is full of anxiety. It wants to be and do something. It wants to do like I did as a young Christian. I wanted to get up and pace. I couldn't sit still. The second part was to internalize, to yield my will and receive forgiveness for any emotional blocks that uh, saying I can't sit here, I can't sit here any longer. Well, that's, that's your flesh dying. Let it die. <laughs> and all of a sudden you'll realize that the peace of God transcends all of that and you go, I must have made it because the anxiety is gone. I got through it somehow. You're beginning to absorb the reality. And the magnetic pull of God himself is drawing you to himself, so it makes it even easier. Do you ever get in the presence of God and all say, this is easy? If it's hard, you haven't quieted your noisy flesh yet. But when you say it's easy, it means you somehow you've got past that place. And then God's magnetic pull rose on the ascendancy, and suddenly now, that magnetic pull of God himself, you are birthing an attitude. An attitude to love him, to know him, to be more intimately acquainted with him. So number one is choice. Number two, after you made that choice, stay there long enough to die to your flesh. Absorb. Number two is absorb. Three, 
is God is trying to birth an attitude. Wait for the breakthrough. For my thoughts are not your thoughts. My ways are not your ways. He says, I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord. Thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you a future and a hope. He's got good thoughts toward you, but you've got to get the breakthrough. And what you're birthing is an attitude. Now, when I say an attitude, I'm not talking just about a mental attitude. You're birthing a disposition of the heart, an attitude of the heart, a disposition, a, a no-so on the inside. That no-so, guess what that is? That's Jesus himself. That's that divine nature. You can read these scriptures all the time about be a partaker of the divine nature. You can quote it and you have no idea what you're talking about. This is what I'm talking about. This attitude gets written on the tablet of your heart and it affects your character. Attitude. Go over that again. Choice number one, begin to absorb. Stay there long enough until you birth an attitude. Until you win, in other words. After you birth this attitude, expect it to be written on the tablet of your heart. You know, this expectation of having it written on the tablet of your heart, you know how you'll know if that's really happened? It'll be easier for you to believe it than to not believe it. It'll be easier for you to act on it than not act on it. Then you know it became a, you became a partaker of that divine nature. That character, that, that character and nature, that's uh, the fourth part. The attitude's written on the tablet of your heart. You are now a partaker. He becomes a shield. He becomes your exceedingly great reward. You actually see Jehovah Jireh as your provision. <coughs> now, you can use any name for what I'm teaching here because it's simply the way, it, the process, the ways of God working in you and the ways of God that have come working out of you. Now, this character and this nature of God, say it's Jehovah Jireh, suddenly now provision is not just outside of you. Provision is him. I'm a partaker of that divine nature, the character and the nature, the fourth element. The character and the nature of God, the divine nature, is now real in me. It's written on the tablet of my heart. At step three, I birthed that attitude, but now I own it, and I know him. It's not an it. It's him, Jehovah Jireh. I, he's my shield and my exceedingly great reward. The fifth element is, guess what? You know what just happened? Inside of you, your value system is now a person, not a mental concept. Your value system is God himself, Jehovah Jireh. And this is what God was showing me about steep yourself in God reality, God initiative, but steep yourself in God provision to where it's him, not just what he does. Is this making sense yet? This deep, deep stuff. Deep calls the deep, though. So you choose to get in the presence of God. Two, you begin to absorb. Quiet that noisy flesh. You quiet that noisy flesh, you just birth an attitude now. An attitude, a disposition of your spirit being. Drop down to him and it's there. Fourth, you are now a partaker of the divine nature. If it's Jehovah Jireh or any other name of God, what it is now is that nature. You know, when it says in the name of Jesus, you know that means in the nature of Jesus. His name and his nature got a match or that name don't work. Unsaved people try to call, cast out demons in the name of Jesus. It's not a rabbit's foot. It's not going to work because the nature and the name don't match. God's trying to get the nature in you so that when you are talking about the name of God, you've got the nature of God. All right? The fifth element, your value system now is God himself. Can you see now where provision now is? What, what is provision now? God himself, Jehovah Jireh. It's a person, not an it, and it's not just an outcome of, of provision. It includes that because he's your source. Primarily, the provision is to keep you in the work of the cross. And guess what? You know, when you look at, at Abraham's life, real provision has suffering. If you want provision without any suffering, you might as well be a gambler. 
and then they're suffering for the consequence <laughs> or, or something else. But the value system becomes God himself now. All right, you ready? We got it. We're down there. We got Jehovah Jireh, our provider, as a person in us. Here's how it needs to emanate. See, here's a little phraseology that I did. I wrote it in my journal, if I can remember it. It was immersion, saturation. Um, emanation. Satur immersion into the, like a liquid, immersed, saturated. Mm. Once you're saturated with the Word of God, you are more than wet, right? You don't take a sponge and go like that on a drop of water and expect it to just, uh, huh? You, you absorb, and then you emanate. But you can't emanate something that you have never received. You can't give something you don't have. So now, the outworking of this is this one thing I desire of the Lord, Him. And I'm going to seek that He dwells in me all the days of my life. So now here's the outworking. Step one, your value system becomes God Himself. <clears throat> and you're finding yourself doing what the scripture says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. You're doing it now. <coughs> you're not trying to trust the Lord with all your heart. You're doing it. Because he's, he's your reality now. Your value system becomes God himself, and it's the foundation of trust. Trust is the essential beginning for any real strong life. You're... To acknowledge him in all your ways actually means through divine, intimate connection. I acknowledge him in all my ways. It has nothing to do with the head. Acknowledge him in all your ways because it's divine, intimate connection. So the second aspect is the character. You're maintaining that trust relationship by living a forgiveness lifestyle. Does that sound like Kingdom Life Church people? A forgiveness lifestyle keeps you in the place of walking the love walk. Forgiveness is the love message where the rubber meets the road. And so your value system becomes God himself, the forgiver. Not forgiveness as a concept, but the forgiver. Secondly, the character that I'm living now is a forgiveness lifestyle. I like, I like Jude where it says, you were picked by God and preserved in Jesus. That reminds me of my grandma who used to make jelly, you know, really good stuff. She made preserves. But it tasted just as if it was fresh. So we were picked by God and preserved in Jesus. So we still taste the same as we did when he picked us the first time. All right? If you let him. All right, so your value system is God himself, step one. Step two, you maintain that trust by a forgiveness lifestyle. Three, if you are walking in a forgiveness lifestyle, you won't have to try. You will be grateful. Grateful will be automatic. You will have an attitude of gratitude. Did you ever see a, a, a Christian receive Jesus for the first time? They, Jesus, come into my heart, cleanse me of my sin, and I'll live for you and serve you all the days of my life. Ah, oh, thank you. Well, nobody taught you to say thank you. Why did you say thank you? Because it's a response to a transaction that something actually really happened. Otherwise, you don't say thank you. You don't say thank you for nothing. You say thank you for a transaction that took place, a supernatural exchange when you got born again. So you, your attitude is one of gratitude. That's the third step of the outworking. That's how you know if the in-working worked. And you weren't just some kind of religious person who knew the Bible but couldn't live it. That attitude of gratitude then changed to the fourth element, and that is the magnetic pull of God, the love of God 
this is what it meant by you've got this love of God, you've got this attitude of gratitude, and you're walking in the love of God, and you're grateful, regardless of circumstances. And what you're saying is what Paul said, and it makes sense now. The love of God controls me. It's pressing me on all sides, eliminating any other option but the love. And I'm grateful for that love. And I'm demonstrating that love. Your motivation, that's the fourth element. That attitude of gratitude now becomes the motivation for living. Remember, we steep ourselves in God reality and God initiative, motive. And the best part of discernment is knowing motive, identifying the source, good or evil, flesh or spirit. And you don't have to have a gift of discernment to know what's going on in you. All you have to do is be honest of what is or isn't going on in you. But the, the, the love of God presses me on all sides, eliminating all other options. That's the fourth element of the way it would express itself. And lastly, you will see it in their behavior. See, behaviors last because the world has a thing called behavior modification where they just train you to act a certain way. You could, how does a behavior modification work, Jennifer, as a psychologist? It's kind of like, uh, just do it's right whether you want to or not. I got the joy of the Lord because I'm supposed to. I don't have any, but I'm supposed to have it, so I got it. So I'm going to do whatever joyful people do. Yippee, wow, praise the Lord. Huh? You kind of get behavior modification, Dennis's version of behavior modification. <laughs> you won't find that in the DSM manual, will you? Not my translation, but anyway. But behavior has to do with what you're declaring. And I really believe these two scriptures were life-changing for me. John 21 and Luke 24. John 21, verse 23 says, Jesus said to them, Peace to you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. And when he said on this, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they're forgiven. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. Then in Luke, it says that repentance and the remission of sin would be preached in his name to all nations beginning in Jerusalem. In both accounts, he's basically saying, go preach forgiveness. Go preach the love message of Jesus Christ. And forgiveness is the way that you would demonstrate your sins are forgiven. Tell the world their sins are forgiven. It's what, what Jehovah Jireh was all about on, on Mount Moriah. He looked ahead to the Lamb of God that would take away the sin of the world. Preach forgiveness. Their sins are forgiven, but preach Preach it to the people that need to hear it are a lot of times already Christians. Hmm? If, so if Luke's account and John's account are both saying that your behavior should be a forgiveness lifestyle, that that's the best any Christian can do with the love message of Jesus Christ. It proves that it's real in you. If you can't do that, it's not very real. You need to repent of that not being very real. Because forgiveness is where the rubber meets the road in the love message of Jesus. Go preach the love of God. Go preach the gospel of the kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Thank you for joining us. You've been listening to doctors Dennis Clark and Jennifer Clark from Full Stature Ministries. To explore more life-transforming resources, and deepen your faith journey, please visit us at forgive123.com and our online school at teamembassy.com. All rights reserved under applicable law. For details, please see our copyright policy on our website. Again, that's forgive123.com.